please be seated. It occurs to me as we are seated in this space, quite sparsely um, compared to our usual norms, that there are 12 of us in the room. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? 12 of us. This is the Jesus disciple paradigm right here, 12 of us. Pretty cool. I want to spend some time with you thinking about our gospel this morning, and I want to ask the question, what is your shoreline and what is your lake? What is your shoreline and what is your lake? Every time, every season, there is a shoreline and there is a lake. I think it's safe to do this because Luke, um, if you uh, are familiar with this gospel, he was never at the Sea of Galilee. He uh, was writing from somewhere in Asia Minor. He was telling the stories that he had received about Jesus and Jesus' teaching. And we know this from the kind of way that he wrote, from the beautiful Greek that he wrote in. Uh, and then he said these words about the Sea of Galilee, and he called it the Lake of Gennesaret. So that is the only place that the Sea of Galilee is referred to as the Lake of Gennesaret in the scriptures. And it's kind of like us saying, instead of the Mississippi River, something like um, the second largest river in the world <laughs> when we refer to the Mississippi. It's kind of a similar kind of um, indication of his familiarity. So I mention this because I think Luke was also understanding this story not just as a literal story about a miraculous catch of fish, but also a story that has a metaphor and a teaching for us. So, what is your shoreline and what is your lake? Jesus has been moving through the Galilee. He has been teaching and everywhere he goes, he does miracles and people start following I think it's safe to imagine this scene along the shoreline with just hundreds and hundreds of people. If you don't have health care, if you have an injury, a, a chronic illness, this is where you're going to be. It is the one place of hope in the whole region. Plus, this guy is so interesting, so everybody wants to learn more about him, this Jesus. And so the shoreline is full of people. It's so full that Jesus has like no space. He cannot project because there are so many people around him. So he gets in the boat, he pushes out. Even the fishermen are on the shore at this point. They're washing their nets and he is sitting in the boat, probably just a few feet out so that there's some space and they're looking, they're going up the hill. So maybe a back wind behind him is really helping to move his voice over the crowds and he's teaching. But at some point, he tells the fishermen, set your boats again, let's go out. We're going to get a catch. At that point, they had a choice. But when we begin, they're at the shoreline. And here's what I want to tell you about that shoreline. That is the place we all are. We all start on the shoreline. We all start as Christians with these foundational teachings that Jesus was providing to those people there. That's where we're at in a lot of times in our lives. It's sort of our normal. And we also start there in our culture, the family of origin, the culture that we live in, the experiences that we've had, the things we're told that we just accept that they're true and we live in them. That's our shoreline. When I was uh, growing up, I lived in a very non-diverse culture. I didn't have friends who are of color. I didn't have a lot of experiences with people who are different from me when I lived in the United States. And so in my formation as an American, I was formed in very unconscious ways to think that everyone was just like me. It's just the way it was. That was my shoreline. When you were growing up, maybe there were things in your life that seemed normal that now as you've become an adult you realize were not. You've realized that the shoreline was not entirely what you thought it was. And at some point you were called into the deep place, onto the lake. That's where Jesus invites his disciples. When I got that call onto the lake, I was in my 20s. 
my husband Scott and I were driving in a car. We lived in Milwaukee. It was just gotten dark. It was winter, so it was probably dark at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> we're driving along through this part of Milwaukee, and there were a group of black kids walking down the sidewalk, and we were sitting at the light. And I reached over, not thinking about it, no preconceived anything like, oh, I'm afraid. It was just see a group of teenage black kids, boys, probably, they were so bundled up, hit the lock on the car. Just did it. Didn't think about it. Just that was my shoreline experience. You just crime, all that stuff, you get formed to, hit the lock. Those kids came running over to the car and they went boop, 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 on the roof of the car. Just, you know, just like, hey, we saw you do that, and it offended us. And I was, of course, like, oh, here they come. You know, I'm so afraid. It was my shoreline moment. It felt risky. It felt frightening. It felt like, wait a minute. What did I just do, and why did I do that? It took me years of a journey out into the lake to unpack all of it. But that was the moment when I realized I needed to go out on the lake and I needed to go deep about some stuff inside of me that I hadn't thought about. That's just one example. What's your example? What's a place like that for you? Maybe God is inviting you to it today. So Peter, you know, he's a fisherman. All those guys that got called back out into the lake, they'd just been out there, and it had been useless. They hadn't gotten what they needed. He needed economic security. He was at risk, especially if he was going to follow Jesus, which he did. For me, the lake was that realization of prejudice, of racism. Maybe yours is healing from a past that you've been afraid to. Maybe you're sailing along on the surface of the lake all the time, and you know there are deep places that need to be plumbed, but you don't want to go there. Maybe that is a relinquishment of an anxiety or fear, and, and doing that is hard, and it's hard to know how. Maybe it's a toxic relationship. And you need to launch out, but it's terrifying. We have a choice. We always have a choice. We can sit on the shoreline. We can skim along the lake forever. But if we're going to change, we've got to let down our nets. We have to obey the call of Jesus to a kind of discipleship that is risky and hard and transformative. Those are our choices. Do it or don't do it. It's hard. And look at Paul, the Apostle Paul that we heard about. He saw himself as a sinner. He was a persecutor of the church. But when he encountered God, but God, by the grace of God, transformed him, and he went from a persecutor to a persuader, where he, he challenged people and showed them that who God is is expansive and wide and inclusive, not the kind of narrowness that he had carried before that relationship. Simon Peter, when he started to see that God was transforming him through his risk of lowering the nets, he recognized his own sinfulness. He said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He realized that there were painful things about himself and he had to get vulnerable about some realities about himself. So do we. I had to realize what was inside of me. I wanted to think I was a really nice person all the time, that I treated people with equanimity and that all people were valuable in my sight. It's not true. I can tell you day by day, I have to work to weed out things within myself that make me make assumptions about people because of how they look or what they do. And so do you. But by the grace of God, I am not the woman I was when that happened to me back in Milwaukee. I have changed because of the power of God to be with me as I plumbed those depths. So I can speak to you with confidence to say, indeed, siblings in Christ, there is power and capacity to move past the shore, onto the lake, down into the deep, and see transformation. What is your lake? What might God be calling you to trust God for and do? 
This week, I would invite you, if you didn't read Ephesians chapter 4 from last week, do it. It's a beautiful chapter. Do it. And maybe spend some time thinking about the answer to those questions. If you're a person that is visual, draw a lake, draw a shoreline, parse it out with words, put yourself there and think about it. Engage that metaphor and think about how God, open yourself to the Holy Spirit's leading for what that might be. Maybe you know it right now. When we begin to trust our discipleship with Jesus, we experience life more richly. And most importantly, we move past the self into our connection with others. If we don't trust, if we don't take risks, we lose. We die. We stay on the shoreline and forever wait to be fed like little birds. My dad had, was a psychiatrist, and he, he had a metaphor for people who wouldn't change but like to complain about things. He called it 25-pound robins. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> it's, it's the idea of, you know, I'm going to sit on the shoreline, and I want you to keep feeding me some nice spiritual nuggets and some nice memes about hope, but I'm not going to do anything. Just keep feeding me, keep feeding me. I don't want to be a 25-pound robin, do you? No. God has called us to the grand adventure of life, the grand adventure of eternity, which means not staying put, moving forward, experiencing transformation, even if it goes through death. That's the foundation of Christian faith, that there is resurrection, that it might look like Jesus was dead for three days, but we know life is can happen afterwards that Jesus rose from the dead and it was so absolutely persuasive for those who witnessed it that they were willing to die. That is foundational. That is why we are here 2,000 years later still celebrating the power of God for transformation. So let's not sit on the shoreline. Let's go deep. I had to get out on that lake and realize that my whiteness had impaired me, that my whiteness meant that culturally my ethnicity was completely erased. Where my ancestors came from, were they French, were they German, honestly, I still don't know. All of those traditions, all of the who I was as more than that is, was lost. My mom was Canadian, so they still knew they were Scotch, right? They knew that they came from Scotland. And you probably, I'm not saying everybody who's white doesn't know where they came from. I'm just saying indicative of whiteness can be the sense of loss of our own cultural heritage. And in addition, there are other ways that whiteness makes us who are white different, impaired. There's also lots of ways in which it makes us unaware of our own power, and unaware of the fact that if I were walking down the road in Milwaukee with a group of my teenage friends, the me in the car would never have hit the lock on the door, right? And that's what I'm talking about. Those are things I had to change from. And God has used that and transformed me so that I have a richness in my life because of that change. Same for you. If you could be up here, those 12 of us in the room who are Jesus' disciples, we could make those same statements. So thinking about the racism thing, I think about a dean of Dean Chapel, dean of Luke, wait, excuse me, let me start over, the dean of Duke University Chapel. Back in the 70s, he was a very godly man, I am sure. He was the dean of a church, right? He was a godly man, but he had not left the shoreline of his racism. And so there was this preacher named Samuel DeWitt Proctor, who was an amazing preacher and man of God, who happened to have a lot of melatonin in his skin. And when the, Duke, the, the dean of Duke Chapel was asked to invite Samuel DeWitt Proctor to preach, he said, no. Over my dead body will we have a black man preach in this chapel. Well, guess what? He died. And they buried him in the nave of the church. There's a plaque there with his name on it. And several years later, 
Samuel DeWitt Proctor got up and preached in Duke University Chapel over his dead body, right? We don't want to be left on the shoreline, friends. We don't want to be that person, do we? We want to be people who take risks and go deep for the power of God to be in action in our lives. Peter, he leaves the fishing behind. That miracle provided everything he needed financially. It was done. He could leave his family. He could leave his mother-in-law. He could go follow. Whatever it is that that pulling up means for you, it is going to be good. It is going to be transformative for you and for others. We all have the deep places that we need to go. Do not be afraid. Leave everything. Let's follow. Let's launch out together into the deep. <laughs>